Bible, and let's turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. <clears throat> Great story of a healing that is uh, that made a lot of waves here. Uh, let's begin at verse 1. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? The man? Or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he, said, when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with his saliva and spread it on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. But he kept saying, I am that man. They kept asking him, Then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. And they, said to him, they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know him. Verse 13, they brought him to the Pharisees, this man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees began to ask him how he had received sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they asked again to the blind man, Who do you say he is? What do you say about him? It was your eyes who he opened, and he said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received sight until they called his parents. They called the parents of the man who received sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. You ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Well, I'll stop here, but we know the rest of the story, and we'll get to the rest of the story in a minute. You probably recognize uh, that this story was the story that inspired John Newton, the great hymn writer, to write Amazing Grace. Was once, uh, once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. This was the passage that served as the inspiration for probably the greatest hymn, or at least the best-known hymn, certainly, in the history of Christianity. Uh, it came about because John Newton himself was a rough character in his early days. He uh, worked on a slave trade ship. He was uh, uh, a, a, a man addicted to, uh, and they didn't even talk about addiction back then, but he was, had an alcohol addiction. He had uh, engaged in a very uh, not so good lifestyle that almost killed him. And uh, once on, the, on board a ship, as it was in trouble, he cried out to God and basically said, God, if you are there, save me. And uh, the ship uh, did not go under, and he did not drown. And when he got back to shore, he surrendered his life to God and actually became a minister. And one of the first, as he went into training, one of the first things he wrote was the hymn we now know as Amazing Grace because he learned that this God who... Uh, had mercy on him, uh, did this a lot in the Bible. <laughs> this God sought out people who were lost and reached out to them in love. This God expressed through the, his son, Jesus Christ, walked around finding people who were ill and who were blind, which again, I, don't, I, I remember telling you this one time, we may have forgotten, okay, uh, there are a few things in the ancient, uh, you know, time here, 
that were considered no-nos to mess with. Even if, and it wasn't uncommon to have these sort of uh, what we would call kind of street corner preachers back in even the first century, you know, before even before Christ. And they would be they were they were called wonder workers. They were sort of these sideshow miracle worker people, and many of them were kind of tricksters and got run out of town. <laughs> okay. But the thing you would get in big trouble for, you, you'd get run out of town if you were a fake, okay? But if you faked uh, these three things, you could get arrested, or worse. And here they were. Uh, pretending to raise the dead, got to consider a no-no. Don't mess with dead people. Don't pretend to raise dead people. Don't fake us out about dead people. Because, number one, death was mysterious and kind of a realm of God, life, and death, and you don't, you don't mess with that. That's, that's too blasphemous. That crosses the line. You can heal little stuff, but don't pretend to raise the dead, or not only would kick you out of town, we might arrest you or throw stones at you. <laughs> okay. Second thing, and people uh, you know, don't really realize this, but casting out demons. Uh, don't pretend to cast out demons, because... We actually believe in demons, and uh, uh, they believe that if you mess around and sort of fake the demon thing, you could open up our community to demons, and that would be bad. So not only would you get kicked out of town for pretending to cast out demons, you'd get arrested and even stoned to death. I mean, bad trouble, okay? Number three, which is the one that you would think would be not so bad, but hear me out. Here's the third one. Pretending to heal blind people was a no-no. Why would that be? Well, they didn't have glasses back then like we have, and uh, you know, they didn't have eye surgery like we have. And uh, Someone born blind was particularly in trouble. They couldn't work the fields. They couldn't get a normal job. They couldn't function in society well like they can today. They, they couldn't back then. There was no recourse for them no meaningful way, and it was seen as mockery to pretend to heal blind people or to, even, to fake it. If you were caught faking healing blind people, that was that third category. It was seen as unmerciful, as mean-spirited almost, as mocking blind people to try to do it because there were so many, if they were born blind, they, they, many of them were forced to beg for their living. And so... If you fake the whole healing blind, it was seen as giving false hope to too many people who were too hopeless to get anything done. And you could get arrested. You could get in big, big trouble faking, you know, being a wonder worker. Again, you could heal other stuff. Someone was lame or crippled or limping or whatever. And you did that, whether it was for real or not, it was seen kind of as a sideshow. But not those three. You didn't mess around with those three. It crossed the line. Um, so, of course, in Jesus' ministry, we see, for instance, at the beginning of the book of Mark, like the first three things Jesus does, right? Cast out demons, and then he heals blind people, and then, oh, by the way, he raises the dead, too. So all these three things he just, like, violates. And no, so you're, you're wondering, well, why, why are the Pharisees so mad at him? Why are the Jewish leaders so mad, at, angry at him in these little villages when he does these? Well, he picks the three that they say, don't even fake it. Don't mess with that. And Jesus does it. So, with that context in mind, right, when he does this very public healing of this well-known guy in the village who was born blind, who most of the time has to beg to even get food because his parents can't afford to help him out. They're busy and they're help, trying to help him. But they, you know, right, I mean, he's another mouth to feed. He, he, if he's going to take any responsibility for himself, the only work he could do, quote unquote, would be to, to sort of beg. And so Jesus comes along, and the disciples ask a question that I'm sure most people are too afraid to ask out loud as they walk by this poor guy who is seen as just without hope because nothing you can do for blindness. There's no glasses. There's no, right? Uh, and, and they go, well, who, who sinned that this happens to someone? And, of course, Jesus answers in a way that we would hope he would answer uh, that we know now to sort of be theologically true. Well, when we get sick, it doesn't mean we've sinned necessarily. I mean, sometimes we walk outside of realms and get ourselves in trouble. But most of the time, you know, basically Jesus says sometimes we're in this kind of world where 
a just sort of fallen world where things happen that we don't like, that even God doesn't like. But, he says, that even in these tragic situations, God can bring glory to himself. Now, sometimes we know that that's through complete healing, sometimes not, in that way that we would think would be good. But either way, Jesus says, God's not out playing gotcha. God's not out zapping people just because blah, blah, blah. Right? And so, so Jesus answers them in that way. And then he does something that gets him into trouble. Which is, he messes with that third category. He walks up to the man, and not only does he sort of just touch him and move on, he makes a, a very big public display about the mud and the blah, 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 why do you do all that? Well, there's a lot of theories about why he did it that way. Sometimes he just spoke, sometimes he touched people. And this, he, he sort of makes the mud, and sometimes gross, but it's a, he was doing it in a very public way. He was saying to the religious leaders of the day, you're not God, kind of I am, and you can't tell God how to do stuff and what not to do. You, that's not your realm. And I think as religious people, it's a good reminder. <laughs> it's, I mean, for us preaching types especially, but for all of us who are in the church, it's a good reminder that we don't tell God what to do. God tells us what to do, right? Uh, and, and so I think as a public display, he's just going, yeah, you, you don't really control what God can and can't do. God will tell you when it's right. And so he does this in a very public way. He goes down to the Pool of Siloam, which is actually a, 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 a body of water in the area that was kind of well-known. People kind of hung out there. It was kind of a community place. So again, like, don't hide it, right? Now he's just like, publicly, I want you to go walk into this water with this stuff on your face. I want you to wash off publicly in this pool in front of everybody and then see what happens. So, you know, it's not like the blind guy, with all due respect, had anything better to do. So, he goes down and does that, comes up out of the water, and he looks around and he's able to see. A miracle has happened. Not only has it happened, but it's happened very publicly, right? And now, the race is on to see how it happened and who in the world would, would, would attempt this, you know, third category of no-no? <laughs> who would even try this, and how dare he try it? And oh yeah, he did it on the Sabbath, which, you know, that's a problem. Uh, how much trouble can Jesus get into by doing good? Again, maybe another question that it wouldn't hurt us to ask every now and then. How, how, I mean, if, we're, if I'm going to get in trouble... We've all gotten in trouble. Uh, let me get in trouble doing good. Amen? Still with me? I mean, hey, that ought to be the cry of the church, too. If we're going to make the papers, which Lord knows <laughs> we're good at that, if we're going to make the papers, let's do it for doing good. Right? If we're going to be controversial, Lord knows we've done plenty of that, let's do it for doing good. Too often, of course, we as the church mess that up. We, we do get in trouble for the wrong reasons. We make headlines too often for the wrong reasons. Hey, let's take an example of Jesus. Go ahead and make the headlines if we have to, but let's do it for doing good. And this is what Jesus is doing. And it is bringing glory to God and yet it's causing people who like to control God and control God's business a lot of consternation. Okay? A lot of trouble. This story was so overwhelming, going back to John Newton, our hymn writer, uh, was so overwhelming to Newton, he said, he looked at this story and he said, that's me. That's me. Because he had made a name for himself in the bad way. He had been public in a bad way. And now he is a changed person that everybody's going, I think I know who you are, but you're not who they said you were. Okay? And so one of the first things he does, he writes this beautiful chorus, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. I mean, wretch is a bad thing. Don't go around calling people that. <laughs> right? A wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, like this guy. I mean, say this way. Like this guy in John 9 that I just read about was blind. Now I see. 
I think Newton and in his journal struck with a little bit, but gets tired of people going, what happened to you, right? And I think it reminded him of, and I didn't even read the rest of John. You already read a couple times where people were going, hey, what? who did this? What happened to you? Everybody knows you're this, we've known you your whole life. You're the blind guy on the corner. That's how we know you. That's your identity. That's all we've ever known you as. And now you're able to see what is going on with you. Who did this? What happened? Right? Not just once. Several times in John 9. And I really do believe that, that Newton got tired of people going, John Newton, yeah, I, I know you. I know who you are. Right? That's always scary. Right? You're, you're hoping if someone knows who you are, that's a good reason. And you know I joke about this, guys, and I'm, I'm, I'm serious. It's not, I make a little light of it, and I'm, I'm very humbled and grateful for it. But it happened to me again the other day. I, I went to the farm breakfast. You guys hear about that? Over there's a, It was farm day or something, agricultural day. And I'm like 600 people gathered in St. Joe to celebrate farmers. It's an annual breakfast they do. And my bosses invited me to come along with them because, you know, Different stages in one room. People know who you are. They don't know who you are. They know who you are. So you come. I represent the station. I'm like, okay, I'll get up at six. So, you know, <laughs> for my night shift, I'll get up. Go, which I did, take one for the team kind of thing. And, you know, I show up and it's nice. And I mean, hundreds of people, politician types, and farmers, and, and FFA people, and national agricultural leaders, and state agricultural it's nice. It's wonderful. Nice breakfast. Good job. It's cold. It's early. And I pull in thinking there'll be a handful of people, and there are hundreds of people. And look, I, and it's so sweet. And I walk in, and it's like one of those, like, hey, Charles. <laughs> you know, Lord, I don't know half these. I, I don't know a tenth of these people. I, I know a few people. Uh, uh, and it was like, hey, I'm sitting at the table trying, you know, I want it to be about whatever. And it's like, hey, news guy. Hey, guy who writes a column. Hey. And, I, you know, my bosses are smiling. They're like, that's why you invited me. And I'm like, it's 6.30 in the morning. I'd rather just have breakfast and watch what they're doing. I know. Why you here? Because we want people to go, hey, that's Charles. That's the guy. So, and I, you know, and, and I joke about it. And it, it's sweet. And it's so, I mean, I'm so humbled and sweet. You know, I mean, it's nothing really. But it, it's nice. And uh, I... I think, I, I sit there and I go, and I tell my wife, I joke with her about it, and I say, oh boy, a lot of hellos from people I don't know, and she's like, well, you knew that was coming, you know, and I was like, she goes, well, at least it's for the right thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> at least then I go, I know who you are, you know what I mean? And so I thought about this text, and I, you know, I knew I was preaching on this this week, and I'm like, this guy, known for being the blind guy, I mean, that's all he's known for, and all of a sudden, it's different. You can see now. You can interact with people now and know who they are. You can recognize voices and say, I, now I see your face. There's something new happening. What do you do? How do you answer for this? How do you explain this? And the greatest answer, I think, in the whole Bible is given later on in this chapter, which many of you have over again, where finally they just keep questioning and they bring him before the religious council uh, have you been faking all these 30 something years? No, I really was blind. But here's the thing is, who do you think he is? Why? He must be a prophet. I mean, why, right? That's what he says at first. Like, he must be someone from God. And they just keep asking him. They won't let this go. And finally, you'll see in chapter 9, he says, Here's the greatest answer in the Bible. All I know is this I was blind. Right? Like you guys can debate theology all day if you want. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with good theology debate. But I'll tell you this. At the end of the day, I used to be blind. And now because of Jesus, I'm not anymore. Okay? That, I mean, case closed. Or, I mean, like, nothing else we can say. I mean, you can debate me all day long. With, you know, he's a sinner. That's what they were saying in this one fact. Well, how can that be? He's a sinner. Uh, it, it, we think he's trying to put himself because we don't, you know, he doesn't like say the things we want. You know, we can't control them. We, we, we don't get him theologically. Who is this guy? And he, 
at the end of the day, the guy just goes, look, ah, you guys sort it out amongst yourselves, but I'll tell you this, right? Like John Newton says later on, I was blind, now I see. That, that, that I know for sure. At the end of John Newton's life, in fact, John Newton was sort of uh, He lives, actually, uh, to his amazement. <laughs> Uh, you know, the country star William Jennings. You guys know Anyway, uh, next is guy. The country star William Jennings uh, had a lot of health issues at the end of his life. Continued to tour and sing as long as he could, but he had a rough young life. Read up on it, it was pretty bad. But, uh, you know, did some things that he didn't remember later on. I'll put it that way. Had a rough life, drinking drugs and stuff like that. And then kind of got clean and sober toward the end. And they asked him, but, but his health suffered from it, and he wasn't able to tour as much. He ended up you know, dying of some liver issues and things like that. And one of his last interviews, they asked him about that. Do you regret that? He just said, well, let me put it this way, Hoss. That's how he talks. He's from Texas. And he goes, uh, let me put it this way, Hoss. He said, if I'd known I was going to if I'd known I was gonna live this long, I'd have taken a lot better care of myself. <laughs> I think it's a great effort. And Newton was kind of that way, you know, 100, 200 years earlier. He just, as I knew, basically. And so at the end of his life, he would be pastored for the, until the very end. And he was in his 80s and stuff. And he, his, his memory began to go uh, pretty bad. Not just most scholars who, study him, look at him, say, well, just because, you know, when you get older, your memory goes, it was the effects of other stuff that he had done and taken early on that it affected him at the end of his life. So much so that his parishioners began to notice that people that he had known for 10, 15, 20 years, he would forget their names, he would forget things about them, and have to be reminded. Tough when you're a pastor to have that happen, especially. And uh, finally, story goes that uh, a couple of leaders from the congregation came to him and said, Pastor Newton, we, we know that your memory is fading, that you're struggling, and we, we care for you. We will set you up on, on a pension. You don't have to do this anymore if it's too much of a struggle for you. Uh, we'll take care of you. Uh, in other words, right, we, we know this is a difficult burden for you now with your mind the way it is. And he smiled and thanked them and said, uh, well, I'm going to continue on because I believe at this stage of my life I only have to remember two things. Uh, the first is to remember that I was such a great sinner, <laughs> kind of a sinner, and, and second, that I serve a great Savior. Those are the two things I really have to remember. What was he saying? I've forgotten a lot of things, but this thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. So, a couple things we learned from this healing before we go. First, I believe, is this. Um, in order for us to be really changed, I believe we must have a, a genuine encounter with Jesus. Uh, no matter what the results of it are, no matter how how that turns out, sometimes it's complete healing sometimes we're still struggling with some things but I think a genuine encounter with Jesus which comes by the way uh, by God's initiative we call it grace right God reaches out to us in creative ways to get our attention to bring us toward him uh, that real encounter with Jesus and let me tell you this no matter how big or small it is means something it means something not only to us personally that changes our lives and brings us into the kingdom but here's the deal it means something when we encounter other people and bear witness. So I guess what I am saying is don't think that we have to have some, and, I, and I'm, I'm appreciative of these stories, by the way, these gigantic foxhole stories, rescue stories, in order for our witness to mean something. Those are nice, and if you have that, certainly make use of it. And those are great, and I, I, I like those. Those are ones that books and movies are made of, and I, I'm, I'm excited about those. So don't shy away from those. But I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, even if we don't have that kind of story, go ahead and make use of the story you have. Because that genuine encounter with Jesus that you had means something. Okay, Even if it's not like John Newton or some of these great... It's okay. 
Because a genuine encounter with Jesus produces a story that will b- draw others, attract others to Jesus. And I guarantee you, even if it's not some big dramatic thing, every single one of us who calls himself or herself a Christian can say, I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. Even if it's when you were six or seven or eight or whatever, I was lost, but now I'm found. Jesus called me out. He saved me. He forgave me. He empowers me to this day. Hey, that story means something. Big or small, it means something. Why? Because it it comes from a genuine encounter with the living God who is looking not only to save you, but to change the world through you. So that's that's meaningful. And don't forget that. And don't underplay it. Uh, a university student was in a complicated math class. I tried to avoid those if I could. But uh, he was in a complicated math class uh, and was, it was a kind of a, calcul- a pre-calculus kind of class. And he was called to the front by the professor to work on a very difficult problem in front of the class on the whiteboard. And so he's working it out and the professor's kind of talking the class through it as this kid is trying to, and he's not great at, at it, <laughs> okay? And so he's doing the math, doing the math, and, he, and the professor's just talking kind of ahead of him, and he can't keep up. And so the kid is just writing and writing, and finally in frustration, he goes, dot, 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 in parentheses, then a miracle occurs. <laughs> <laughs> and just sits down. And, and of course, the students see it, they laugh, the professor keeps talking, he goes, oh, okay. Well, and, and, and the professor was able to use that and go, well, sometimes it seems like that's what has to happen to solve these problems. But here's the deal. In our lives, any encounter with God through Jesus, we can actually write that into our lives. Here's what was happening, and it was weird and complicated and difficult or whatever. Then a miracle occurs, right? And everything changes. And the answer becomes clearer. And God fills in the blanks. And God saves. And God redeems and heals and leads and comforts in guides. We can say, then a miracle occurs. Because the miracle is that wherever we are, whatever age we are, whenever it happens, whether it's kind of a, a common thing with no big flashing lights, or a big thing with big flashing lights, either way, we can say, a miracle occurred. God stepped in and made something ordinary into something extraordinary. So that's 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 what this guy experienced. Then, uh, I, you know, right? He's trying to talk him through it, and he doesn't have the theological words for it like they have. And he finally just goes, "Look, a miracle happened, right? I was blind, and now I can see. Don't you guys get it? I don't care what day it happened on. I don't care. Yeah, that's your business. Whatever you need to do to deal with that. But I was blind, and now I see. Secondly." When it comes time to tell others, start with what you know. And be honest about what you don't know. It's okay. Look, and I'm all for you know. I mean, when I was called to ministry, I was at the end of a business degree, a marketing degree. My undergrad is in marketing with a music minor. And I was, you know the story, but I was like two months away from the LSAT exam, which gets you into law school. And I had talked to three law schools. I was on my way. And I was kind of excited about it, so much so that I carried my LSAT prep book everywhere like crazy because I wanted to ace it the first time and get into a good law school that I was talking. So I was excited about it. And my dad was in law enforcement, you know the story, and never got to, I mean, he did some training, but never got to go to college and because uh, of circumstances. And, and he and I would talk about the law a lot. It was a bonding thing with us. And even as I grew up, I'd ask him questions about the law. And he was had a great legal mind, but never got to go you know, to law school and those kind of things. I think he could have done well, but he never got to do that. And he was fine with that. But he, I, I felt like I could sort of carry the ball you know, <laughs> in that way. Now, God had other plans, and I experienced this call that really shook me. And you guys know that. Some of you know that story. But long story short, I you know, end up calling my mom and dad and saying, hey, 
I'm not going to go to law school. I'm not going to go into seminary. He's dead. And I thought, oh, my dad's going to be disappointed. Of course, he was not. He was incredibly supportive and basically said, if God's telling you to do this, don't, don't say no to God. You know, you do what you need to do, and God will work it out. And thank God. You know. But this idea of uh, calling and uh, uh, training, you know, once, once God did call me, I was like, I, and you know, my personality is not one that, is as comfortable sitting in a library for hours at a time. <laughs> I mean, and yet that's what I had to do, and that part of the calling, and, and, and saying, gosh, I felt behind, you know, because I had buddies in seminary who had religion degrees and had studied this and kind of going through it the second time, and I'm, it's the first time for me, and I'm just like feeling overwhelmed, and fortunately I had buddies I could meet with and go, okay, well, why am I behind on this, or, you know, can you help me with this and all that, and they did. And, and God blessed it, and seminary went well, and it, I thought, oh, I'm finally going to seminary. And then I got this opening to teach a little bit, and I loved it. And I went to the dean who let me teach a class with my master's degree, and I said, how can I do more of this? Because it went well. He goes, yeah, Charles, it really did went well. The students really, really benefited from it, and I appreciate you doing it. But you're going to have to get a doctorate if you're really going to want to do this more. And I was like, really? More school? Oh, I'm not... You know my personality. I'm not the kind who can sit and just write to her. I mean, you know, he goes, well, that's, you, you talk to God about it. And, and so then, you know, through a, through a process, I got accepted into a doctoral program and just went to work, man. And just, God blessed it, and somehow that happened. <laughs> and so, uh, in fact, uh, 20 years ago this fall, I finished my PhD. So, uh, uh, and, and I still pastored, and I love pastoring more than I love the classroom, but I love the classroom. So I've gotten to do both over the years. And uh, uh, in that, so I'm all for like getting as much education as you can, okay? But here's what I'm more for. Start with what you know. Start with the encounter that you've had with God. And the things you don't know, just be honest about. What I love about John 9 is that the, the great theological minds of the day were trying to sort of put this guy in a corner and they knew they had more theological weapons and tools than he had, right? But he kind of won the debate. <laughs> I like that part. It kind of makes me happy because he was able to go look. Whoever I think he's a prophet, as far as I know. And I, I think he's from God, as far as I can tell. You guys have all the language. You guys know the scriptures better. But again, back to here's what I know for sure. I was blind. I couldn't see. I couldn't support my family. I couldn't support myself. I couldn't do anything except for beg. And now I can see. And things are better now. And I have joy, and I have peace, and I have healing. I have those things I didn't have before. And I'll catch up with you later about this stuff that I'm so behind on, but here's what I know. See? I love that. I think that's really the Christian life boiled down, is that we start with what we know. We don't, we don't make fun of, of, of higher education or what. We don't. We, we embrace it. We're, it's good stuff. It's not bad. But here's what I know. I, look, even after my PhD, right after my PhD, I was sitting on an airplane. How close was this? I was sitting on an airplane, and you know, you know again, my story, I'll, I'm not the biggest fan of flying, uh, uh, because it's so high in the air. Anyway, uh, and and so, and, and this guy, I have told you another story about people sitting by me, but it, this is what happened, believe me. This guy was sitting beside me, I haven't told you this story. This guy was sitting beside me, of course, my wife was this side, my wife was beside me. She always prays, she likes to fly in silence. And I like to talk to people. Keep my mind off being 35,000 feet in the air. Helps me. So I look for people. Now I don't, I try to bug them, but I look for people who are, you know, susceptible or <laughs> open to that sort of conversation. And not everybody is, so sometimes I just have to read, listen to music, and kind of pair it. But every once in a while, God, in his great sense of humor, sits people beside me who like to talk or who need to talk, just like me. Yay. This was one of those days. Okay. I thought you know the, the other Mary Kay lady one time, right? You know that one. That that was the other one. But this was right for this was 20 years ago. This dude, this guy, sat down beside me. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm watching for signs. You know, I don't interrupt, but I'm like, I'm gonna need to talk here, so the dude there, hopefully, Lord. And the guy about like just as we get up in the air, he goes, 
Oh, I'm glad that went well. That's what he does. And I'm thinking, that's my guy right there. That's a kindred spirit right there. And I go, yeah, man, I know what you're talking about. That's, whew, yeah, that's the hardest part to take off the landing. Oh, yeah, now here's what I didn't expect. And this is what I, the conversations I don't like on planes. He goes, uh, yeah, especially after that plane crashed over in Scotland. I was like, oh, Lord. I was like, yeah, I'm trying to think about that. He goes, oh, I can't help it. He goes, my, he goes, you know, my sister had a friend on that flight. I'm like, oh, Lord. What have I gotten myself into? Maybe I should be quiet on planes. Um, and he goes, he goes, I noticed you were reading something like that looks religious, which I was, you know, it keeps my mind off seeing 35,000 feet in the air. And uh, I said, yeah, I, I'm going to read a little bit on the plane, I think. <laughs> Especially now, I'm thinking, now I'm for sure. And uh, he goes, so why do you think God would let something like that happen? <laughs> Not the conversation I was going for. I was thinking, I was thinking, I was going, you sound very fair. <laughs> I mean, can we talk about that? But I, I didn't. Uh, and I said, well, sir, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor, and I also teach religion at the University Seminary. He goes, ah, you're the guy I need to talk to. It's like, not right now. <laughs> and uh, long story short, I said, well, can I, and this, this is a God thing, I know, because I, I said, can I, can, I, can I tell you about the article I was just reading? I like, yes. <laughs> Maybe, maybe he'll be quiet. And uh, but here, guys, here's the article I was reading. I promise. It was kind of theological, like a, from a theological journal. But I was trying to break it down into everyday language. I'm a preacher, and that's really what we try to do. We do it right. And I said, I was just reading this article about how mysterious God is. Oh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, and it was basically saying we're in this world that's kind of messed up. And because it's so messed up, the after effects of it being messed up means that bad things happen. But it also says, God doesn't like you. It makes God sad when you're sad. And there are things that, that God can control directly. But there are things where God limits himself mysteriously. We don't know why. But we know God hurts the people who hurt. I said, that's, that's the only comfort I get out of something. I don't like when bad things happen to people. I said, sir, I've done a lot of funerals. I, I don't like funerals. But I do them because I believe that there's a better story after the tragedy. Somehow. And he goes, I have a lot to do with this today. It's really bad. Because we've got two more hours to go. And he goes, uh, you know, I've never met a religious person who said that. it was about much more than that, by the way. But it was at least about that, so I just kind of gave him that part of it. And he goes, can we talk a little more about God now? <laughs> I'm thinking, well, that'd be better than talking about crashes. <laughs> I didn't say it. I saw it. And I said, yes, we can. And my wife heard it, and she just said, I just started praying, because I was like, here we go. Right? <laughs> Two hours of And, uh, let me just tell you, and not all the stories end this way. I've got a lot of stories like that, but we got to go. But here's how that story ended. He asked me to pray with him at the end of the flight. He asked me for my card, which thank God I had. I always have my cards with me even now. And I, and I gave him a card. And you know this guy two weeks later called me and said he and his wife and his kids had found a church that connected with them. And he said in the email, Thank you for reminding me that I don't have to figure everything out, but I can start with what I know. And I know that God is with me. And then I'm just lost. Now I see. That's where I'm going Right? Hey, if we can expand from there, do it. Don't be afraid of that story. And let that story propel us into the lives of others who need to hear about this good God who walks 
just around trying to find ways to heal, trying to find ways to save, trying to find ways to comfort, trying to find ways to love. Maybe we can do that. Stand up. <coughs> Gracious God.